Thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. Let me turn the presentation over to Shannon Royce, Director of the HHS for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives. Shannon. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate um, everyone joining us today. My name is Shannon Royce and I'm the Director of the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives. That's kind of a mouthful, so we tend to go by the Partnership Center as our short name. We're so grateful to have you join us today for this second webinar in our webinar series on mental health concerns and COVID-19. Um, as we are addressing these issues, our first webinar just dealt with general concerns uh, coming out of uh, COVID-19 concerning mental health. And this next webinar that we're doing today, we're really pleased you're joining. We'll be talking today about trauma, fear, and anxiety related to COVID-19. I want to introduce our speakers to you momentarily, but before I do, let me touch on a couple of housekeeping items. The first is, this is an educational webinar. It is not intended for press purposes, is off the record. And if you're a member of the press, we would ask you to let us connect you with our press office at the end of the webinar. So um, off the record for this educational webinar. The second thing is we find sometimes that some people have difficulty hearing uh, the webinar through their computer. So if you're having difficulty hearing uh, through your computer, there's a phone number on the Zoom platform that you can use to call in and listen through an earpiece. And some people find that a lot um, more effective in their, um, their ability to hear with clarity. Uh, sometimes this is due to the um, internet connection you have, however you're joining us today. So we'll just uh, keep that in mind that if you're have, tr having trouble hearing, you might want to use the call-in number. The third thing is just to note that we will be sending the link to the recording today out to everyone who registered for um, the presentation. So stay tuned for that in the next day or two. If you have any specific questions related to that, you can email us at partnerships with an S, partnerships at hhs.gov. And finally, we do have a full program today, and so we'll be taking as many questions at the end as we're able to do. Uh, but just to test out how that's going to work, if you'll go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. And today's actually kind of a special day because this is Ben's birthday. And I'm gonna have him show his face to you right now. And just to see how out of there he is. Happy birthday, Ben. Uh, this is kind of a big birthday for him and I won't say what the number is, but you can be guessing. Uh, so if you'll just come uh, go to your Q&A just to test this and wish a happy birthday to Ben from wherever you are in the United States. Uh, we're really grateful that you're joining us and it's kind of fun to do this on his birthday. Wow. That's kind of cool to see. Lots of birthday wishes for Ben. So thank you for indulging me in that and honoring him. So we're going to turn to our webinar now. During these challenging times, we expect that many people are coming to faith and community leaders to share the concerns in their daily lives. And some of these concerns may be really overwhelming, really challenging, um, perhaps uh, just really distressing in people's lives and causing uh, great fear, anxiety, and trauma uh, to them. If faith and community leaders can identify and consider when people may be experiencing something more than is just a typical concern, uh, then they'll be better equipped to serve those people and know when they need to refer them out for further assistance. We would also be remiss if we didn't recognize that faith and community leaders themselves may be experiencing great um, stress and anxiety during this time as well. And so we want to be caring uh, for each other and for those um, in our communities um, faithfully. And so we are here to serve you today in that. Today our presenters will help us consider some mental health challenges that we expect to increase as a result of COVID-19, specifically trauma and anxiety. And I'm pleased to have the chance to introduce them to you now. First, we'll hear from Dr. Jamie Aiton. Dr. Aiton is the founder and executive director of the Humanitarian Disaster Institute and Blanchard Chair of Humanitarian and Disaster Leadership at Wheaton College. He's a cancer survivor, 
which is a great story he shared in his book, A Walking Disaster, What Katrina and Cancer Taught Me About Faith and Resilience. Jamie will co-present with Kent Annan, who is the Director of Humanitarian and Disaster Leadership at Wheaton College, where he leads uh, the MA in Humanitarian and Disaster Leadership. He's the author of multiple books and will share out of his background in ministry. And finally, we will hear from Dr. David Rosmarin. Dr. Rosmarin is the Director of Spirituality and Mental Health Program at McLean Hospital and an Assistant Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He supervises the provision of spiritually integrated services in clinical units throughout the hospital and collaborates with laboratories to study the clinical relevance of spirituality to anxiety, mood, and other disorders. Based on his work on anxiety disorders, Dr. Ross Marin will speak from a clinical perspective on helping lay leaders know when someone is experiencing unhealthy levels of anxiety um, and how to encourage them to receive professional assistance. I think all of us are experiencing some level of anxiety in this season, uh, but we really want to know how to serve those who are experiencing overwhelming um, anxiety. And so David will be talking with us about that. Finally, David mentioned yesterday, and I was so pleased to hear that he has a recent article in Scientific American. So it's really exciting to see that, that the important work he's doing is breaking through some of the barriers that we have previously seen. So Jamie and Kent, thank you for joining us today. We will start with your presentation on trauma during these days. Jamie, I think we're going to hear from you first, so we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Shannon, and thanks everyone for being a part of the webinar today. We're really grateful to have the opportunity to join in and share some of the things that we've been learning. And also want to start by giving a special thanks to Shannon and Ben and their whole team uh, at the center and for all the great work that they've been doing helping faith communities during this time. I want to start with a short story. I had moved to South Mississippi just six days before Hurricane Katrina hit. And even though I'm a psychologist by training, when that storm hit, I remember just feeling completely at loss, not knowing quite how to respond to this. And within a few weeks, our team started doing research to study the important role that faith has to help people overcome times of major crises, traumas, and anxiety. At the same time, we found that many of the clergy that we were interviewing often reported that they weren't quite sure how to help. So since that time, we've spent the last 15 years studying mass disasters, public health emergencies, and humanitarian crises around the globe. And so today, Kent and I are going to be sharing about spiritual first aid, a unique intervention and manual that we've recently launched at the Institute. And I'm going to start by talking about some of the background behind it. Over those last 15 years, one of the things that we really found was that our overall well-being, our emotional well-being, our spiritual well-being, even our physical health is often tied to the types of traumas that we're experiencing. And that those things and our needs are all interrelated. That if we're having a spiritual need, that that spiritual need may have a direct outcome on our physical health. And that the physical health challenges that we have, such as during times like COVID-19, may also in reciprocal ways have an impact on our spiritual well-being. So one of the things that we try to do through our research has been to try to identify what are those kind of core needs that people have. And so I'll let Kent speak to that. But I want to let you know that what we're sharing is based on the last 15 years of our research, and we've spent four years field testing uh, our intervention before rolling it out for COVID-19. But the biggest takeaway that I've had is I think about the research that we've done over time, and also in a recent article that we published in an American Psychological Association journal, um, looking at uh, psychological trauma and disaster mental health and faith. And what we found was it wasn't so much just how religious or spiritual person was that predicted resilience, but it was more about how they engaged their faith. So, so let me explain to you what I mean by that. That you may have two people that are identical in their level of devoutness, and they even maybe go to the same faith community and both lose something very similar in their life or are challenged very similarly by COVID-19. But one person is able to view that and find comfort in their faith, whereas the other person feels that maybe they're being punished by a higher power in their life. And we know from the research that the individual that engages in a way where they struggle to find comfort are more likely to struggle more and to struggle longer. 
So it's not to say that struggle is bad, but that we need to really walk alongside those individuals in particular, to provide the support that they need. One of the other big takeaways that we found in our research is that basic social support from a spiritual community can go a long way in preventing problems that could be small from snowballing into more severe pathology or other types of uh, struggles that people may encounter. We also know that across the research studies that we've done, that providing that positive spiritual support can also reduce a lot of significant distress caused by uncore met needs. So overall, the intervention that we're introducing is spiritual first aid, and it's the very first research-based disaster spiritual care intervention. And it's uniquely developed to provide care from peer to peer. So it's not necessarily an intervention that we've designed for mental health professionals, but rather for the lay helper to be able to care for those that we may be sheltering in place with, or to be able to provide support and care to our neighbors by, by means of physical distancing. So Kent, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now. Yes, thank you, Jamie, and thank you to all of you and for hosting this conversation. Um, yes, so as Jamie said, with all of this research and then we come into this moment of COVID-19, which is different in some ways because of social and physical dis distancing, but in other ways it's what we were working on for 15 years of research and four years of field testing. So that how do we do these interventions uh, when there are not enough professional mental health workers to care for everybody's needs as in a moment like this? And the research also has shown that interventions like this that can meet core needs not going to the deeper underneath mental needs mental health needs but meeting core needs can have significant long-term impact for positive outcomes for people going through a, a trauma and a challenge such as COVID-19 and finally with this context and with this knowledge can lead us to uh, this very helpful way to engage people uh, with a simple bless method that we'll tell you about here uh, and that takes a four-step approach and the four-step approach is and I'll go into more detail quickly, is to attend, ask, act, and repeat. So we'll look at each of these five methods, each of these five core needs in a moment, uh, and we look at each of these needs in these four ways. We attend first to listen and come into conversation and observe what is happening in a person, not entering as, uh, as a interrogation, but humbly saying people are, are the are the people are those who know their own needs best. So we attend in that way, and then ask, ask what are their core needs? What most needs to be uh, helped in that moment? And we're not trying to uncover deeper underlying needs. What are the core immediate needs? This is spiritual first aid. How do we respond in the moment? And then we act going into what kind of intervention can we quickly do to help take care of some of these core needs? And then repeat, knowing that in one conversation, if it's 15 minutes or an hour, an hour and a half, we're not going to uh, take care of everybody's spiritual and emotional needs. And so we can then repeat the process on that specific need or going into their other needs. Um, so that's the, the basic approach, this four-step approach. And I'll go quickly to tell you the five different core needs that we've identified through research. And then Jamie and I will go into more depth on each of them. So the five core needs that we uh, address and help peer-to-peer -peer, um, intervention to address are belonging, livelihood, emotional, safety, and spiritual needs. So belonging, livelihood, emotional, safety, and spiritual needs. And through this intervention, uh, able to attend, ask, act, and repeat, and take people deeper into this. So Jamie, if you wanna start with belonging, we'll then walk all of you through each of these needs. And one of the things that we really hope that you'll take away from using spiritual first aid is this BLESS method. We've tried to boil down the helping process in a way that hopefully will take away some of the guesswork that you may have and to help provide specific ways to respond that are feasible regardless of our training level. So let's start with that first unmet potential need. As Kent said, the people that we're helping really are the experts on their own needs. So it's okay to ask, what is most distressing you right now? What's the one thing I could do that would be most useful? And so we want to start with that belonging. So this is really looking at those relationships issues that people have, those social needs where we're feeling isolated from others. So we want to maybe ask questions like, where are you finding support right now? How are you doing in terms of feeling lonely or feeling isolated? And then we want to start moving into the act. And so one of the ways that we can respond here is by providing spiritual support. And so again, when we think about providing spiritual support, it ranges on a continuum. 
that even if something is happening where it maybe doesn't seem obvious, we still can do that in a spiritual way. So it's the way that we think and understand people and also maybe move into more explicit ways, um, such as maybe through using spiritual disciplines or sacred writings, and then repeating if uh, an opportunity to do so. The next need is livelihood. So livelihood is health and finances. And we know right now that this is a, a huge stressor in people's lives with the devastating uh, unemployment numbers. So attending to health and finances, checking in with people about that, observing, uh, what is happening in their lives and asking them resource questions. What are their most urgent needs right now uh, that are really pressing on them, uh, giving them stress that, you, that you're not solving the long-term issues, but how can we help them with resource? And then if we understand that, listen to people well, ask them questions, we're able to act primarily through connecting to faith-based community and healthcare resources. So we're connecting them locally to ways that they can help address some of these livelihood needs that are urgent in their lives. And as you're thinking about the five needs, the goal is as you interact with the individual is to really start by just giving them space to share how they're doing with you. And more often than not, that will let you know which of these five needs that you should be addressing. So the goal is not to try to go through these like a checklist, but rather to listen through that attending and then from there choosing the one that is most pressing. So for emotional needs, this is where we're really focusing and attending to mental health. So what are we noticing when we're on Zoom? Does the person look very scattered? Are they having troubles concentrating? And then if we need to, to start asking some more in-depth questions, specifically focusing on well-being. And then the way that we intervene here is by facilitating lament. So if you look across most faith traditions and most world religions, that this is a shared experience and language that many can relate to. And so what we mean by lament is giving space for someone to share and to grieve about what they're going through. But now we don't want to push them to share before they're ready, but we want to sit there and honor them in that suffering and to help to start to pull them out of it as we go forward. And then the next, so if we do the belonging, livelihood, emotional, and then the, the fourth is the safety need. And so this is where in the attending st stage step, we're looking for red flags. Hence, are they uh, experiencing violence, uh, self-harm, suicidal thoughts or behavior? Are they, are they in danger from a spouse who they're with? As we've read about, you know, different uh, statistics of upgoing spousal abuse in time like this and domestic abuse. And so we're looking for those red flags and then asking uh, threat and harm assessment questions. One of the helpful things in the research shows, I think people, especially in peer-to-peer, -peer, don't know with these safety questions, should we ask, for instance, if someone uh, is having ideation of suicide or going down that route? And the research shows, yes, it is important to ask. And we can ask that in a way that's direct and helpful and people find that helpful. And then we move on to acting, which is then a refer and report if people are in danger, either from themselves or from someone else. So again, we're linking them, we're asking, we're doing humble listening, and then linking them to resources uh, in the community that can step in in the right ways. And as we think about those safety issues and think about threat or harm to self and others, it's also important to remember that we should be on the lookout for potential warning signs that maybe somebody's in an abusive relationship. The, is there interpersonal violence happening or domestic violence? We, we also want to make sure that we're attending to are there signs or things that maybe make us concerned about elder abuse or child abuse, for example. And then as we think about spiritual needs, here we're really zoning in and focusing on attending to meaning making and religious behaviors by those that we're supporting. And what we want to ask about are about those spiritual struggles or ultimate questions that they may have, such as coming to terms and struggling with their own mortality, for example. And the way that we can help here is by acting, and that's by encouraging spiritual coping, helping them to draw on their faith and their faith resources in ways that can help them to live more resiliently. And again, as we go through this, you may only be able to attend to one need in that interaction. And I want you to know that that's okay, because sometimes the help will be five minutes. Sometimes you may have an hour and a half that you can uh, share and connect with others. But the goal is to meet people with where they are in that moment and to help them move forward along in trajectory to well-being. I think what we've what we found in this moment as we've talked and worked with faith communities around the country and around the world, uh, that this approach, this intervention is very helpful because uh, whether it's for the faith community leader, whether it's this peer-to-peer -peer people in small groups and communities, they need some way to know how to, what, what is it okay for me to ask? And, 
And then how do I ask? And how, how am I, I'm anxious even in the conversation because I don't know if I should ask this or not ask that. And am I leaving out important things? And so by having this BLESS method, what it does is it can equip faith communities as a way to really have the faith community caring deeply for each other uh, and for their community without missing something and without anxiety that's added on to a peer who would want to care, reach out to someone else but wouldn't know how. So I think that's the strength that we're finding in this method, especially for COVID-19, is because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, because there's so many needs in our communities right now, it can reach out and make a difference uh, in a way that people can do virtually. So this intervention works by phone, it can work by, uh, by Zoom, and uh, to have an intervention like that is very helpful indeed for a moment like this. Uh, so we've created all kinds of other resources around this. We do a weekly webinar on Fridays as well. We have created tip sheets. We have a free online course about self-care in this moment, all at spiritualfirstaidhub.com. And so we continue to develop resources as all of us continue to learn. Uh, as you continue to serve your community, we hope that spiritualfirstaidhub.com can continue to be a growing resource uh, for you that you can keep coming back to to help you in your leadership, but also to help you provide resources for others. I worked in Haiti after the earthquake. I've worked in refugee camps in different places around the world. Uh, and I, to see this happening now in our country um, in such a widespread way, it's wonderful to have these 15 years of research to back up a, a really simple intervention that can make a difference in people's lives. And to be able to find out even more information and go deeper with spiritual first aid and getting tips and recommendations on how to even deal with tough topics like how should or should you not ask about suicide related types of issues that you can find more on the spiritual first aid hub by downloading our free manual and just look there for this SFA COVID-19 edition of spiritual first aid. Also wanted to share just briefly before passing it on about a couple of new resources that are coming forward that we will also be having a new version of SFA available in Spanish soon. We also have a devotional that's informed by psychological principles that will be available in 31 different languages and that should be live in about a week's time. We also have a new manual coming out on considering how and when to reopen churches, including focused on spiritual issues. And we offer a new online trauma certificate available in participation between our master's program and the clinical mental health counseling program here at Wheaton College. So thank you for your time and we'll hand it over to David now. Wonderful, thank you so much guys. Um, a couple of people have commented in the uh, chat and Q&A that they are having a little bit of trouble hearing. And so just a reminder that if you're having trouble hearing, you can use the call-in information uh, that's provided by Zoom and uh, that will help you probably hear with more clarity. That was a really helpful and practical, Kent and Jamie. We really appreciate your being with us and talking about trauma um, and its effect on folks' life. And David, we will turn over to you to hear now about anxiety and how folks respond to that. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie and, and uh, Kent. That was great. Really awesome, awesome talk and, uh, and um, honored to be part of this. Always great to partner with the Partnership Center. So I'm just going to share my screen because um, I have slides. So, okay. Okay, Ben and Shannon, how does that look? We're good? We're good. Okay, good. We're good. Excellent. All systems go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for attending this webinar. And I wanted to speak about some anxiety management. Um, also, firstly, how clergy can manage and faith, and faith communities can um, help individuals who are struggling, but also how uh, clergy and uh, leaders of faith communities themselves can potentially manage their own stressors because we're all in this together. Um, so for the past several years, this is long before COVID even started, American society has struggled very significantly with anxiety in, in general, in particular, and mental health concerns in, in general. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, one-fifth of uh, individuals countrywide, adults, have an anxiety disorder, and that's every given year. So at any point in time, point prevalence is 
20% of this country. Well, 19.1 actually, but pretty much one in five. And over the lifetime, it's, it's actually two fifths. And that's just anxiety. We're also seeing um, serious mental, mental uh, disorders occurring in about 5%, uh, nearly 5% of the US population. It's one in 20 people who are seriously incapacitated by most of all depression, but also uh, substance use and other, and other concerns as well. And in fact, suicide is the second leading cause of death in the United States. And um, if you look at college students today, what you're finding um, in, in many of the epidemiological studies that up to 20% of college students today are engaging in self-injury, meaning they're destroying bodily tissue just to cope with negative, with negative um, uh, emotions. So that, that was all before COVID. Now, since COVID, um, well, we, were, we saw a poll at the beginning, how many people are feeling stressed and nervous. And um, I think this seems like this group is faring a little bit better than, than uh, national norms. Um, a lot of people were in the several days or not at all camp, but um, uh, many people also struggling more than half the days or nearly every day with, with symptoms. In, a, in, the pan, in the span of just a couple of weeks, um, it seems that the prevalence of um, mental health concerns has expanded rapidly. Um, and that makes sense. We're under a lot of stress, significant economic concerns, concerts and sporting events are all, are all canceled. And I live in Boston, so that's a big deal with my Red Sox. Um, graduations are all um, on hold, are now virtual. Families being sequestered together. There's um, it, early indications of uh, greater domestic violence happening, and greater use of substances, um, and I mentioned the economy as well. Um, so our behavioral responses, uh, our emotional responses are not entirely a surprise. However, if you put them in a historical context, we have to consider something, which is that in decades past, the extreme emotional responses that we're having now, they didn't occur even in times of war. I was not alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Full disclosure, 1962 was before my time. But that showdown between the Soviet Union and the United States, which literally brought the world almost to destruction, um, more destructive than COVID-19 by a long shot, um, that didn't cause the behavioral and emotional fallout that we are seeing today. American life barely changed. Kids went to school, parents continued to go to work, albeit, you know, with a little bit of some adaptations like gas masks, but, you know, it wasn't the incredible fallout that we were having today. I want to be clear, I'm not advocating for going outside right now. You know, I'm, I'm in my home. I, I'm, my family's taking this very seriously, as should everybody here. And the stressors are real, you know, during a pandemic, as opposed to a war, there are different precautions to be taken. But I, nevertheless, it's definitely a head scratcher to be thinking, why are we so anxious now? Even it seemed to be more than previously when it was much more significant in the past. And more importantly, how can we cope? So I want to address both of those questions. How can we cope and the potential aspects of why, which I think as faith leaders, and individuals in faith communities, you will find um, interesting, I hope. Um, so in terms of coping strategies, there is a lot that we can do. And this was, um, Shannon mentioned before, Scientific American piece, which I had, uh, which was published last week. Um, and that was the main theme, that we are not at the mercy of our anxiety. There are things that we can do, many things that we can do. There are cognitive things, behavioral things, interpersonal things, and perhaps most of all, spiritual things that we can do. Cognitive, cognitive things that we can do is primarily keeping our, our thinking in check. Um, many people today, their thinking is getting out of check. And what that means is running amok, letting the wheels turn without having any stops in place. And that's a time to check the facts. And if we are having people in our congregations who are doing this, then we need to remind them um, that the majority of people will not get COVID. Um, among those who do get infected, the the vast majority will not lead hosp need hospital level care. And even those who do need hospital level care, the majority will survive. And those are important facts that we all have to keep in mind. That does not minimize the situation. That does not uh, mean that we leave our houses, but it does mean that we have to keep things um, focused on the actual, the actual facts. Um, but more than cognitive approaches are really behavioral approaches. Behavioral approaches mean that our, our, our emotions follow the way that we behave. If you behave a certain way, your emotions will follow it. Um, 
it's not only that our behaviors follow our emotions, right? It's not only that motivation precedes action, motivation actually follows action. And with regards to anxiety, the number one um, recommendation that I can make is to get a good night's sleep from a behavioral perspective, is to get a good night's sleep. Sleep, diet, and exercise are your three go-tos when it comes to um, anxiety and really all behavioral health, all mental health. Um, but with regards to sleep, I'll tell you a study that I'm, I'm just doing with some colleagues now. In the first three days of the pandemic in New York, um, some folks at Columbia University and I um, got data from about 300 uh, New Yorkers who were in the epicenter at the time, it, it just north of New York, um, in uh, where, where things were really exploding. Um, and we, we looked at a whole host of different behavioral factors and, and cognitive factors and also um, risk factors um, for COVID and for uh, emotional fallout. And what we found was the number one king of all the risk factors was sleep and that people who were getting higher quality sleep and more quantity sleep were, we accounted for 40% of their distress just in terms of their levels of sleep, which was far more than any other, vari any other variable. So it seems to be that working on that one thing, getting to bed by 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, something reasonable, and shutting off our um, devices a half an hour beforehand in order to prep ourselves for that bed, for, for, for that sleep, for that time, that one recommendation, I believe, would account for a lot of people's um, anxiety. But in addition, exercise, which we can do something about, and diet, which, well, we can do less about, but we can try. And those are three recommendations there. Another piece is with regards to media. People who are checking in that study in New York, people who are checking media 16 times a day or even eight times a day, which is once or twice, um, once every waking hour or once every other waking hour, as opposed to people who are checking once or twice a day, four times a day, once every four waking hours about um, at most, um, there was a substantial difference between them. This was the second biggest factor um, that we used as, as predictor. Um, and this could be one of the reasons why we're faring so much worse now than we did during the Cuban Missile Crisis, because we have unfettered access to all this information and it's streaming in. And it's like drinking from a fire hose and a lot of people can't, just can't process it. And that's, that makes sense. It's too intense. And we do need to have vacation time every day um, from our devices, um, especially when spending time with family, although we'll get to interpersonal struggles. In fact, that's next. Social support is gonna be your next one. And, and here is one where I think we're, we're doing an okay job um, as a nation um, because things are actually, we're actually more social now and more connected in some ways than we ever have been, which is a little bit bizarre. Um, there, are, uh, there, are, there are lots of ways that people can connect with others in, in their lives. However, there also is um, a lot of family tension. And I think specifically in faith communities because they tend to be family centric. Um, people who have families or right, more likely to be involved in faith, and faith community members are more likely to have families. So with regards to family tensions and family um, dynamics, one key strategy here for our own families and for the, our congregants and the people in our communities is going to be um, taken out of a page out of emotionally focused therapy. Sue Johnson's amazing work, um, which is based on uh, probably two decades of basic relationship science. And now the clinical science is evolving to, I think, a pretty impressive place that one of the key strategies in maintaining connection is to rely on the people who we love, to tell them, I'm struggling. I need your help. Can you please be there for me? I see you're struggling. Can I do something for you? And that's, in some ways, what relationships are, is pooling our resources together as opposed to living independently. But a lot of people don't feel comfortable saying, hey, I'm struggling, or hey, I see you're struggling, can I help you? And getting beyond ourselves and you know, leaning into the relationship as opposed to the other two options are usually um, turning away and focusing on, only on ourselves or focusing um, uh, not leaning on the other person or turning against. Um, turning against is when we get into period, uh, to states of anger, um, and obviously those are not helpful. And the turning away, I would say, is also not helpful, um, not, certainly not as much as turning towards. Um, however, uh, I believe, um, as a clinical scientist, that the most powerful methods that we have 
for dealing with um, anxiety and other symptoms today come from spirituality. And this is potentially why um, our world is so uh, rocked by COVID-19 and, and it was not the case in previous generations, in previous decades. Just to give you a couple of uh, broad based, uh, uh, big picture uh, data on this, according to the Pew Research Center, in 2007, not that long ago, 78.4% of the American population was Christian, identified at, with the Christian faith. By 2014, anybody know? The answer is 70.7, nearly an 8% drop, and currently at 65%. So in the early 60s, it was 95%. So we have seen a, a massive change in people's identification with faith. Today, 26% of US adults are atheists, agnostics, and, or agnostics, or nothing in particular. In 1963, backed by the Cuban Missile Crisis, or a year later, it was 2%. Um, this is the first international crisis that we are facing in the United States with these levels, levels of faith so low. Even after uh, uh, September 11th, right? Um, that was, we, we're talking about 8, 10% 10, 10 higher of the population more of the population having, having more faith. Um, and this, I think, is where uh, the Partnership Center has done some really phenomenal work. Because if you look at the American Psychiatric Association, um, and if you look at um, even the CDC, you find these wonderful guidelines in terms of keeping our thoughts in check and keeping our behaviors in check and even keeping our relationships in check. But we really don't find a lot talked about when it comes to spirituality and faith. And these resources are some of the richest that human beings have and especially in times of crisis, especially in times of crisis like today. So let's talk about a couple of spiritual strategies. I know um, the previous presenters talked about them as well, but things that we can do ourselves and things that we can inspire others to do. First, gratitude. Gratitude is a spiritual emotion because all world religions um, speak about uh, the importance of gratitude in their, all major world religions, um, speak about the importance of gratitude in their expected, respective texts. Also, it's empirically linked to religion. Those who have more faith tend to be more grateful and to show more gratitude to others. That's even experimentally. Uh, there's experimental research that, in fact, uh, if um, gratitude is greater after people pray, if people engage in a prayer, they're more likely to be grateful. That's, that's been experimentally manipulated. And we know that gratitude has a very positive effect on human emotion. There are reams of social psychology literature. Regretfully, in the clinical psychology and clinical psychiatry literature, it's very sparse, um, which I think is a shame. Um, there's a surprising paucity of that data. But there are studies that are showing that a brief daily gratitude diary, a, a, a daily gratitude uh, exercise, um, can have a, a very positive effect on, on people's, on people's um, mood. And there's so many things to be grateful for today, whether that's running water or more time for sleep, which I hope we're getting because we're not distracted by our devices, or more time to be with loved ones, access to modern medicine. There's an incredible miracle happening today, in fact, if I can wax spiritual for one moment here, which is that this situation is very perilous, but isn't it incredible how few children are being affected by COVID and how the immune systems of of children and even teenagers seem to be more protected against it. Yes, there are individual cases, but it's few and far between. If this pandemic affected kids, it would be a whole different game. So I think we have a lot to be grateful for. And we can inspire others to feel that gratitude in our positions. Another piece is acts of kindness. Pro-social acts are very clearly, they're, they're not necessarily spiritual. I mean, you know, religion doesn't have a patent on being kind. But there definitely is evidence that religious individuals give substantially more charity to than secular individuals. In fact, 65% of affiliated um, uh, versus 56% of unaffiliated Americans give to charity. So it's a, you know, more, about a 10 point difference. And in fact, 73% of all charitable giving in the United States currently goes to religious charities, which is pretty amazing. Similar to gratitude, there's a paucity of research when it comes to acts of kindness. Um, most research on this focuses on the, the importance of receiving acts of kindness as opposed to providing, which I think is a shame, but it is definitely important to inspire others to give to others, to give people opportunities. People need engagement and opportunities to provide for others. 
whether that's um, having a call-in hour in a faith community where everybody can, you know, you have 10 people on the uh, 10 people who take turns and there's always somebody available to speak to for other members in the community if they're having a hard time, um, or many other options, which I'm sure you know better than I do because, hey, a lot of your members of faith, uh, not only members, but uh, participants in faith communities um, and leaders. Another piece is meaning making. Um, this quote actually, interestingly, probably was not Viktor Frankl, um, but uh, it, it nevertheless is a Viktor Frankl-esque quote. And um, it's uh, the, the idea here, um, Viktor Frankl was an, Austri an Austrian Jewish neurologist and psychiatrist, and he survived the Holocaust. He was in um, con uh, one of the concentration camps, and he had an observation in the camps that people found, who found meaning and purpose, people who had something to look forward to, they actually were more likely to not only, uh, not only um, survive emotionally, but actually survive physically. They were more likely to be able to make it through to the other side. Um, there's so many aspects of meaning, but questions such as why are we here and what are we passionate about and what do we love doing and what are what's our specific goals and purposes that we live for in our lives? These are questions that, in some ways, only faith can can answer. I mean, it's certainly a go-to place in order to address these kinds of questions. I think it's a again a bit of a shame that we're not asking these questions more broadly uh, in the secular space, and that this could be one of the reasons why our, our nation is, is struggling. And I see that uh, many folks here have given good thought based on the polls to, um, to what, uh, what they are passionate about, which is, which is really wonderful. So I think we have to spread that and ask people, what, what's going on? What do you, what do you, what do you, why are we, what are you here to do? What can we do better? Um, those are the kinds of questions. Um, another piece is radical acceptance. This is the serenity prayer, which some of you might be familiar with. The concept here um, is basically, it's a simple concept, though it's challenging, of course, to put into practice, like all good things in life, which is, can we accept life on life's terms and not on our own terms? It's about stopping to fight against reality, because when we stop to fight, we suffer less. Radical acceptance is a challenge usually for those steeped in Western traditions, but for those from faith traditions, that can definitely give them a lift because, well, we have predictions for everything these days. We need to know exactly when, where, and why things are going to happen, and um, we have everything has to be predictable. Well, COVID has told us otherwise, that life is not predictable. Life has a mind of its own, and we are not in control. Um, there are so many things that go on every single day that are just beyond the human capacity to control. And in fact, if we think about it, every, almost every major factor that influences our lives is beyond our control. Like, did anybody here on the call choose when, where, or whether to be born? Or the economic or social or emotional circumstances or the period of, of time in which they were born, they were br brought into this world? The more we think about it, the less, the clearer it is that we have less control. In fact, all COVID has done is taken the mask off and made it possible for us to recognize our lack of control. So a key strategy here is to face, not to avoid, the reality that we are vulnerable and life is not within human control. And I think once people have that from a faith perspective, that's actually, ironically, a comforting thought because I don't need to be in control and that's okay. It's okay that I'm not in control as opposed to, oh my God, I'm not in control everything's out of control, something terrible is going to happen. Like, not necessarily just because I'm not in control will something terrible happen. I like to think about this when I get on a plane. I get on a plane and I sit down in my seat. Well, I don't do it these days, but okay. I sit in my seat and the pilot goes into the cockpit and the cockpit door close, closes. And I have no control over that plane. And I am blissfully happy with that because I don't know how to fly a plane. I don't want to have control in that situation. And that's kind of the way I think about it today, that, and faith can get us, I believe, to a place where we're okay not having control. Another thing faith can get us to, and this is sort of my last one, is uncertainty, embracing uncertainty. We don't know what is gonna happen next. That is the reality. And the more we can tolerate uncertainty, the more we can embrace uncertainty and say, it's okay for me not to know what's gonna happen next, 
the better we are going to be able to handle COVID, the better we are going to be able to handle anxiety and stress in general. And I believe this is a deep spiritual perspective that many faith traditions speak about. And uh, it's actually potentially um, the op this creates opportunities for us to, to be resilient. Today, people who embrace the uncertainty as opposed to fighting against it are collaborating in terms of medical, uh, you know, in terms of medical research. Here in Boston, we have uh, MIT and Harvard Medical School collaborating on over $115 million in research uh, just to take on COVID-19. That's not, that's a very atypical thing around here. Normally people focus on their own silos, their own bodies of research. Here we have cross collaboration, we have data sharing, there's international, uh, international sharing going on. There's medical innovation. Telehealth has, has really come of age in a big way. Education, I mean, the education system, it's clear, needs major reform. And here we have opportunities, unprecedented opportunities to expand e-learning platforms, homeschooling, to have very dynamic pro programs, which are starting to happen on a national scale. Um, the bottom line is that there are tremendous blessings that can come from any crisis, and COVID-19 is no exception, but we can only see those opportunities when we embrace uncertainty as opposed to fighting against it. Um, now, all of those are strategies we can use, whether they're cognitive or behavioral, or whether they're interpersonal, or whether they're spiritual. However, many people, despite using those strategies, will still continue to struggle. People within our communities, people maybe even ourselves, and that's perfectly fine. It's acceptable and it's understood. It's not anything to be ashamed of at all. When that happens, it's time to get help from someone else. Um, all of these different strategies can be used um, on our own, but they can also be used with a professional to help us regulate our sleep, to help us repair relationships, to help us have different perspectives, practice more gratitude, embrace uh, uncertainty more, um, become more accepting. These are uh, values and perspectives and behaviors and habits that need to be cultivated often with professional assistance, and there's certainly no shame. And um, I think uh, for, for faith leaders, uh, if we're providing meaningful spirituality along the lines that, that we've discussed, I think that that is a great platform. But if it's not enough, there's nothing wrong with the system. There's nothing wrong with the congregants. And there's certainly nothing wrong um, with you. What it means is that this is an intense situation and something more is needed. And uh, there certainly are resources that the Partnership Center has and others um, in order to be able to, to, to facilitate that. So to that end, thank you very much um, for listening. And um, I, hope, uh, I hope this was helpful. It was very helpful, David. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, looking at that article you sent, I was so struck by the importance of sleep uh, as, as something that I needed to be more mindful of. Besides just diet and exercise, the sleep was really important. So that was a really helpful, very practical thing for me. Um, and I appreciate the, com the other comments that you shared with us. You and Jamie and Kent have all shared really practical ideas. And what I'd love to do is get Jamie and Kent to come back on video. And we will take two or three questions that have come in. We have about eight minutes left. And so I want to uh, touch on three questions if we have time for them. We want to be brief in our responses so we can try to get to all three. Jamie, if you could give us a definition of trauma and just tell us briefly how your BLESS uh, program relates to someone who has or is experiencing trauma. So I think um, as we think about trauma, I want to offer more of a lay definition of trauma. And just that that being when our capacity isn't able to be able to handle the stress that we're encountering. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the BLESS model, we try to support that by meeting that gap in capacity with basic and practical resource needs. That was very quick and helpful. <laughs> Thank you. David, I have one for you that uh, I think probably a lot of families are struggling with right now uh, who have children at home. And that is, how do you deal with the fear that children and students, teens at home are experiencing? How do those um, parents and families deal with those fears that they're seeing in their children? 
How do we deal with anxious kids? Yeah, this is a great opportunity to send the message that it is okay not to be okay. And if people are struggling today, you know, when kids struggle, the expectation cannot be, you need to be calm all the time. You need to be fine all the time. You need to keep your head. You need to do all your homeschooling. You know, we, we have to, you know, of course there are certain, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say I have no expectations, but you know, there have to be certain things going on in every house. But at the same time, if we can validate for kids, Hey, I see you're having a hard time. Can we talk about that in the non-judgmental loving, caring, supportive way that that's what I was speaking about with regards to relationships, leaning into providing, you can even share with potentially with your kids. Hey, I'm struggling too. You know, this is hard for me also. I'm low on sleep, more stressed out. haven't been out of the house, you know, you know, haven't been in my faith community in, in, in months. Um, this is hard for all of us and let's be together as opposed to being withdrawn and being apart or clashing and going against. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Jamie, uh, Kent, do you have any other thoughts on that, how to help kids in the midst of this? I think, I think the, what uh, David said is good. We put together a tip sheet of how to talk with your children so on that spiritualfirstaidhub.com, a, a tip sheet of 10 tips uh, similar to those with some additional ones uh, talking about faith, meaning making, the kind of things we've talked about. Uh, together on this webinar. I think it can be really helpful. We also have a tip sheet on how to speak with older adults or our parents who are struggling in, in different ways mm -hmm. on how to do this. So it is helpful for us to think about how different segments of our population, some overstressed with too much work, some who have lost their livelihoods, uh, people who are older, people who are younger, and, and the more we can think like that, we can really address and speak to their felt needs. Yeah, I think that, that speaking to the parents issue, um, I remember getting a phone call from my dad a couple of months ago. He's 92, but he still goes to the gym three or four days a week. And he called me that morning and said, I didn't go to the gym today. And I knew that really meant something to him. And I, I was like, dad, I know that's really hard for you, but thank you mm -hmm. so much for abiding by these social distancing rules. And I was so proud of him, but for him, in his faithfulness, that was a really big deal. And just to be able to acknowledge that, um, especially as an exerciser myself, he knew I got that and, and that was a good connection point for us. So I'm glad you raised our elders as well. Um, I wanna to touch on in the last few minutes that we have, just how faith leaders who are in the midst of being helpers to others, what advice do you have for those faith leaders who are probably in the midst of their own struggles um, at this point? Some are worried about their faith communities, how they meet the financial needs of their faith communities in this time. There, uh, there are more demands on them in this time. Um, faith leaders are 24 seven. They're like doctors only, they don't get paid as much, right? So they're always on call. So how do you speak to those faith leaders to know how to care for themselves in the midst of their work to care for others? You know, I think one of the things I would really encourage is for any faith leaders that are participating in this to remember that your community needs you now, but they're also going to need you even more later. And so practicing good, healthy self-care practices right now are really essential. And I know there's a lot of pressure and in our institute, we just finished up a grant from the John Templeton Foundation where we were studying the role of humility among humanitarian aid leaders. And what we found is that when our communities view us as being humble leaders, even if that means that we don't always have the answers, that we admit when we have mistakes, that people actually will still perceive you as more competent and see you as more trustworthy. So it's okay to go through this and to have struggles. That's great, Jamie. And the one thing I would add as well is seeing our faith community, and I know you already do this as faith leaders, but to see that you're not just caring for the whole community, um, but you're helping the community to care for each other. And so that's why we've done this blessed method intervention, uh, the kind of things that David is talking about, connecting people with resources. So we really want to facilitate so we can last and be leaders for the long term, help the community uh, care for each other is really is always essential but especially essential in uh, times of high stress like these. That's good. That's good, David. Yeah, I, I fully concur. I guess I'm going to speak beyond my pay grade here. 
but uh, I believe that uh, the verse is uh, the verse says that uh, you should love your neighbor like you love yourself. And I think the obvious implication there is if you don't love yourself, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't love your neighbor. So if we don't fill our own tank um, with gas, we're we're just not going to make it. We're just not going to do it. And self care is definitely not selfish. And it's I think those are the perspectives. Um, it's more about the perspective because everyone wants to do the right thing. And we often think like, oh, I'm going to take this last call. Like, no, it's 10 p.m. Like, it's going to have to wait. It's just, you know, it's just what it is. And we can only do, you, you can only do so much as faith leaders. And, so it's okay uh, to turn off your phone. Please do. Please turn off the phone. You'll be better rested. And then in the morning, you'll handle it with much more equanimity and with much more strength. Um, really well, David, I, I was thinking of David about what you were saying about how important sleep is. So maybe also for those faith leaders that are struggling with that, to rethink of it as active resting, right? Mm -hmm. That you're still being active, you're still doing something if that's what it takes. I, I love what you said about the importance of perspective. And I read a book a number of years ago that uh, had a significant impact on my own thinking about that very issue, and uh, the the writer said that the very act of resting, the very act of turning off my phone and going to sleep is a faith act because it's an acknowledgement that I'm not in control of everything, that I'm not responsible for everything, that I am entrusting those things to a higher power, uh, to God. In my case, as a Christian, I am entrusting God with all those things that are out of my control, and it's a conscious act of humility. And that was that was very impactful for my own thinking in my own life. Well, this has been fabulous. You guys have been terrific. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will be following up after this and sending the video out to everyone who registered for today's webinar. And uh, this has been thought provoking for me, I am sure for others as well. Uh, so we look forward to continuing the ongoing conversation about this. Our next webinar is going to be two weeks from today on May 26th, and it will be on task shifting. So that will be on how uh, folks who do not have the kind of clinical training that David has, how can they be equipped to help others um, in these, these moments that we're walking through now. So thank you to everyone who joined us today. We're grateful for your presence, and we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Have a great day.